our public engagement with Science Training Special Series, where we talk to diverse stakeholders involved in the running of programs, courses, fellowships, internships, and other training initiatives. Today, Fanuel Mwindi talks with David Wright, who is the Stevenson Professor of Chemistry and the Director of the Communication of Science and Technology, CSET program at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Professor Wright, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me today. Now, quick backstory. I heard Professor Wright talk about CSET at a recent science talk conference in Portland, Oregon. And I knew immediately that I, I needed to talk to him. In this panel that he organized, he had a faculty member from CSET and two students that were also part of the program. So David, I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about CSET so that we can have the context in mind about the program. Well, uh, our program is unique in the country at the undergraduate level. There are just not other programs that are designed as a major to train students in the communication of science. Our program started in 1997 as a collection of independent study participants. And uh, the founder, David Weintraub, you know, thought that there might be a critical mass of students at Vanderbilt who would be interested. And so in 98, we created a, a minor and then eventually a major. In 2015, the program underwent a major revision and uh, began to grow. The, the, the college decided that CSET needed to, to grow or, or die, right? And so uh, David Weintraub made a significant investment and uh, it led to us getting a National Endowment for the Humanities grant in 2020 to completely revise the major, to go from sort of a, one of these typical menu-based majors where students are plucking things from departments all over the university to actually designing a core in CSET um, mm -hmm. that the students would, would, would take. And uh, the basis of that proposal was that we would design the program to train scientist citizens. That is, this is an idea that um, a professor at the University of Washington, Leah Caccarelli, um, came up with that, that basically says, scientists have a moral obligation to participate in civic democratic processes. And a key component of that is their communication of their knowledge in usable ways to the citizenry. And so, uh, you know, that's an entirely different way of training scientists how to, how to communicate. It's no longer scientists talking to scientists, which is typically what we train undergraduates to do, to go to a national meeting or, or a regional <laughs> meeting, right? It's now teaching them how to communicate to the public in, in you, with useful information, right? Yeah. yeah, so your program has three core principles, right? The scientific right. and humanist perspective, the experiential elements in the course design, in addition to the ethics component. Now, these came about because you all got together around, I believe, 2020, right? There was a grant that you received. And so I'm curious if you just take us back there, what did you find? Because you did a quick landscape as well, right? To understand what was missing in the field to then decide these were the three core principles that you wanted to focus on. Well, we were, um, we were really fortunate, not only in uh, the fact that we had support from the National Endowment of the Humanities, uh, but we also had support from our dean's office and uh, a sponsorship from a for a postdoc. And we were able to organize uh, this core group to really begin to ask fundamental questions about what we wanted our program to be. And so, you know, we asked the question, what really makes a true interdisciplinary program, not uh, humanities in the hand service of science, but equal partners, and how could how do how do programs that have these aspects do that? How are they how are they really successful? And um, you know, one of the underpinnings of our uh, perspective was that it you it's the people are key. 
if you if you find a group of people who are really uh, committed, invested in making these kinds of connections for the students, then you begin to to see exactly how far you can go. And so after that, it was like, well, what's the best way to 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 bring those students in? Well, let's give them something they won't forget. Right. And so almost every class in CSET has has this memorable exercise or experiment or activity that students, you know, they become famous at Vanderbilt because students take them. They have this experience that they totally didn't expect. And then the word gets out. Right, and so right, suddenly, right. you know, you have a class like technical writing, which sounds like it might be the most dry, boring class that you could. And it's got a wait list of 20 or 30 people because, because of the experiential component that allows the faculty to meet the students where they are. Yeah. And so you mentioned the, the wait list. I mean, this is impressive. So this is an undergraduate program. That's right. Right. So can graduate students take some of these courses? And graduate, graduate students can take take some of these courses. About 50 percent of the courses have. You know, comparable graduate student courses for credit mm -hmm. uh, in our design. Those graduate students have additional assignments and they work as a cohort because there's usually just two or three graduate students in a course. So they work as a small, as a small group, as a separate workshop group, things like that in the individual classes. Um, and we, I, I would say across a semester, we have between three and five graduate students who would take, take these courses. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the next areas to, to think about expanding is what does, graduate education look like in this space for our program right and it, right. is it is it offering degrees is it, is it offering certificates is it designing uh just courses that graduate students would be interested in taking to develop skills right 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 so i mean yeah you have uh, i think in your talk you mentioned 95 uh majors right and 60 percent of them are double majors right science right. and engineering double majors and then uh, humanities, the other 20, and then the last 20 are single CSET. Uh, right. Um, I'll come back to that. Just hold that thought for a second, because earlier you mentioned you had the support of the dean's office, right? And right. I, I want to get into that conversation a little bit, because some of other deans may be watching this and wondering, other programs watch, watching, saying, how did you get the support of the higher levels and was that important in ensuring this program continues right, to survive and to get to where it is right now it, it absolutely was because the program could only exist on the backs of a few individuals for so long it was it, it's sort of size limiting you know people stealing time you know people cross-listing classes hiding the CSET offering in the physics and astronomy class called the trial of Galileo, for example, uh, or things like that. Well, I mean, people know, I mean, this is what we do and we want a program to go, but eventually it became apparent that if we were going to grow the program, we needed dedicated faculty and uh, some investment. And uh, we've, we've been really fortunate that at Vanderbilt, which really supports interdisciplinary research across a broad spectrum of disciplines, you know, was willing to make that investment. And, um, you know, even next year we'll get our, we'll, we'll finally have a building. So. Wow. You know, wow. So, right so now, when you been virtual sort of, <laughs> that has been virtual with people in offices all over campus. We have one journalist who's in an office in the basement of the old gymnasium. I mean, so, so finally getting some, those kinds of resources seem to make all the difference. I see. So resources, I'm assuming they've probably provided some FTEs, right? That's, uh, in that's hiring right. faculty. Um, and then of course, now you're getting space. Very important, right? That's right. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it, because here's the deal without, without those components, it's really hard to build community 
And that community is really important when you have an undergraduate program. I mean, it's important in all kinds of aspects, but but particularly for an undergraduate program, having community is what helps us uh, build an identity when we have so many double natures, for example, right? So that right. they really appreciate what CSET brings to the table for them in their futures. Yeah, and I think that's what uh, the two students you had on the panel, um, Shell, uh, Noah and Emily, right? right? They were talking about that community aspect and meeting different students from different backgrounds, right? Uh, physics right. and English, and I believe Emily was an English uh, major. Right, right? she is. Um, so it, was this by design? Well, yes. So, so the, the, it, an aspect of the program has always been that there needed to be significant science coursework. So there's 15 hours, five classes. And so that naturally led to science and engineering double majors mm -hmm. because they, they easily sort of achieve that. And that, that's what I call a double majors who go deep, right? But when we looked at it from the side of the, the humanities, we needed to reimagine what science what science meant. And we changed the requirements so that they could also go broad. And so this is what we find many of the, the, the humanities and social science double majors doing, is that they're taking a couple of classes in two or three science, natural science departments and maybe a math, a statistics or something mm -hmm. uh, to get the five courses. And so um, that going deep aspect is what makes it so attractive for double majors in the natural sciences and engineering. Yeah, yeah. And then one of the things that you mentioned in your talk, you mentioned that the core set of courses that you guys have really help students find their voice right? Whether right. it is in oral communication, whether it's in writing. Uh, can you tell us about the, these core courses and what are you doing there to really build this foundation which they can build on top of? Sure. So, so we have three core courses. Uh, we have a public presentation course, uh, which is designed to, to, to give students the skills they need to talk about their science. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's got some basic communication, you know, standard communication, public presentation, know your audience, but it also has a lot of in-person exercises uh, so that people develop rhetorical skills, not just presentation skills, so that they can make arguments and, and be persuasive. Okay, so that's, that's the scientific communication course, which we call CSET 1500. We have... Um, a survey course called uh, Tools and Techniques of Science Communication, which is CSET 2100. This course is designed to give students sort of an overview of, of sort of tools and methods that are based on sort of written, you know, long form journalism, op-ed pieces, letters to the editor, uh, how, how to, you know, do campaign, letter writing campaigns to Congress, blogging, vlogging, podcasting, uh, interviewing skills. So this is the CSET 2100, uh, which also gives students the beginning of their portfolio. So they have a bunch of different kinds of, of exercises, which they can then begin to develop into a portfolio. And then we have a class called Science 25, CSET 2500, which is called Science for Everyone. And Science for Everyone is, is CSET's general education course. It's a big class, 200 students. And for them, uh, it's designed to start with the Big Bang and build up in our understanding. So it's a critical examination of the data about why we think things happened and how you can take the Big Bang to lead to the structure of the atom to lead to chemical bonds, to lead to chemical reactivity, to lead to biological molecules, to lead to evolution, to lead to climate. That's sort of the, the span of the course. For the CSET students in the class, the class is also an exercise in how you communicate these complex ideas 
in in a, in a in bite sized pieces. Mm -hmm. And so these cores work uh, to to build the set of skills that science communicators need mm -hmm. um, to be successful. Don't go away. The conversation will continue momentarily after this special highlight. Problem. You're doing cutting edge research that the public doesn't understand. You're incredibly busy and outreach takes a lot of time. The solution, Galactic Polymath, an education studio that helps you connect to the most important audience for growing STEM literacy, K through 12 classrooms. So how do we connect your research to the classroom? At Galactic Polymath, we create beautiful visuals to communicate your science, design engaging lessons around your data, analyze our data and find out for yourself, align to teachers' standards and practices, help you complete outreach on a funded grant, and win grants by having stellar broader impacts, ultimately simplifying your outreach efforts. Hire us. Let's turn your research into lessons that inspire. Real research, real people, real data, real careers, real learning. Find out more at galacticpolymath.com or email us at info at galacticpolymath.com. And, and then you mentioned earlier that now you, know, you used to have fa other faculty teaching these courses in, in a distributed way, but now you have a core set of faculty. I believe there are seven. That's right. right. That, and, and, I'm, and of course, you want to grow that and expand that. Do these seven provide essentially all that training to, to these students? Or do, do you have a mixed bag of other faculty outside in other departments who are contributing? Well, we well through a series of courses, which we call bridging courses, which are courses that are, that are designed to put science in the context of humanistic understanding, mm -hmm. history of science, science and literature, uh, the economic power of research and development, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, through those bridging courses, we bring in a lot of other faculty to participate in CSET. And so these are in anthro, econ, English, history, uh, some of the foreign languages even uh, have courses about certain figures of science or movements in science that our students can take those bridging courses about. And so in addition to the, the core faculty, the students get uh, a lot of training from the faculty who are offering these bridging classes. Okay, I see. And so about 60% of your students uh, go on to professional schools, right? Medical right. school, school and so forth. And you have that 20% are doing dentistry, uh, I'm sorry, they're doing graduate school, journalism, you know, school, uh, master's of public health. And I'm assuming probably other grad programs, right? PhDs yeah. and programs. Um, do you have a sense, given the length of the program that's been around, have you tracked these students to see in the long term? What are they doing now? Are they scientists? Are they something else, right? Right. So, um, so we have some data. So basically, when we part, when we revised the curriculum, mm -hmm. we started tracking because it was a requirement of the grant. Uh, and our data shows that a lot of the students are uh, actually practicing science communication. So they'll go and get a master's of public health and they'll be a, a, a science communication officer in New York City public health department or in Nashville public health department. We have students who've gone on and completed their uh, journalism program and now are assistant directors at science museums around the country. And so um, the students who graduate with the, the CSED degree find very interesting ways to, mirror the, to match their training with their experience. 
I see, I see. And, and I think in your session as well, you were asking both <laughs> the two students what they wanted to do, right, with, with, with their right. careers. And it sounds to me actually part of the program that they like uh, is the flexibility that is in place, right? Uh, That's right. After they take the core, they take the core, of course, and then they follow their voice, right? Hopefully they find their voice in the core and then they can right. build on it, right? Across That's, the board. That's exactly right. Um, I'm curious, have graduate programs at Vanderbilt, are you collaborating with them in any way? I'm assuming some of them are probably thinking, hey, I would like my graduate students to participate in some of these courses. Are they doing that? So there are some practical obstacles. And mm. one of the practical obstacles is, of course, the the tuition dollars required mm. for coursework and the hours of coursework that go into the basic core curriculum of graduate programs. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty rigid at Vanderbilt uh, in terms of they don't have a lot of room for extra departmental courses, right? Uh, we've, you know, where we've really made inroads is, you know, CSET handles a lot of the, the, the presentation training mm. for the summer research experience for undergraduate programs funded by the National Science Foundation. We have a start and mark NIH grant that goes year round. We run the, the science communication training for those students. And then we run the MD PhD presentation course for the medical school. And so, so that's graduate education, but that's, that's sort of a workshop model, not a class classroom model. And so um, we've been able to make pretty good inroads into that sort of space. Um, it's a lot easier than getting departments to change the required coursework in their curriculum. Yeah. Although you probably would like to see that. Yeah, well, we would, we would. I mean, I'm, we're, we're really interested in understanding uh, how graduate programs train students in science communication. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so in the sense of um, growth, right, that we are, I think you're at this juncture right now, you're, you're learning or have learned a lot of lessons, right? As you think about what's next, I heard you mentioning something about uh, four plus one, right? Uh, right. Potentially thinking, how do you venture into that space? What are the limiting factors for you as a program as you think about what is the next phase of CSET? So, uh, so faculty size is always one limit. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a that's a that's an argument that faculty love to use to try to get deans <laughs> to give them more lines. That's mm -hmm. that's probably not something to bet the house on in any given year. Yeah. Uh, which is what makes a four plus one program pretty attractive because uh, the subset of graduate courses that would have to be developed coupled with the graduate courses we already have on the books makes that pretty doable, especially if the students are doing uh, a master's thesis project. Mm -hmm. And so and so that that is one idea that we find very attractive. We've pursued, we, you know, we've also talked about uh, a, sec a secondary PhD. So at Vanderbilt, we have had programs that were second PhDs that's augmented a, a current one. A mm -hmm. little, something more than a, a certificate. It requires the core hours to get the PhD in this interdisciplinary area. Um, that's we have PhD students in the sciences who would be interested in something like that. But the PIs in the science are worried that it pulls students out of the lab, which is a valid concern. So there's there's some tension in how that would work. Um, and we don't have a good answer to that quite yet. Yeah, because I mean, ultimately, if the, the concern is probably the time to degree that if they do right. this, then it extends the time to degree. But I mean, there's some who would argue actually if anything, this, it doesn't change time to degree. And the other programs are finding that it actually keeps them, right? Students actually engage and, and continue. Uh, That's right. If they're, if, if they're interested, they'll find new aspects 
you know, the number of PhD students, we've had a number of PhD students, particularly in the chemistry program, who mm. took the graduate technical writing course or who took a, a, a graduate course and became science writers with their PhD, right. you know, so. Yeah, so the, the I think that you're right, the tension is there, right? Because right. You, you do have these guidance and the training grants that are in place right now, for example, right? The language changed a couple of years ago, right? That is more inclusive about the variety of careers. Right. In STEM, no longer is the goal of you're going to become only faculty, right? Because that provides really kind of, uh, you know, major constraints, right? For right. those who are designing these programs. Um, so, oh, man, David, I could talk to you all day long here. I don't <laughs> want to. Uh, so we need to have you back. That's why. Okay. So we, we are actually going to get into a rapid round, OK? Uh, All right. So you know, try to keep your answers brief. Uh, and if you, if you cannot, go for it. It's OK. All right? Okay. <laughs> We're all friends. <laughs> uh, what is the most popular course uh, in the program? I, I think it is probably technical writing. Technical writing, OK. Um, if you had a magic wand, uh, what would you do first to support the program? I would speed up the time until, you know, so that we could move into our building sooner. T tell me why is that for, for the community? Oh, so that we can build yeah. community faster. Right. Okay. Cause right now you're floating in space somewhat a little bit. As That's you mentioned true. earlier. Absolutely. <laughs> and so we, and it, and the space is supposed to be available as summer of 25. I'd like it right. sooner. Uh, I see. I see. What new courses do students want to see? I think students would like to see uh, new courses that were centered around uh, science policy. So we have a few science policy courses, uh, mm -hmm. but th that really strikes. We have broad science policy classes. I think they'd want specific like food science and policy, energy science and policy, that sort of thing. Um, I also think that students would be really interested in more uh, sort of venues for writing, mm -hmm. science essay, a course on scientific essays, a course on uh, a creative writing course, um, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your bread and butter skill set that you're training students on? How to talk, how to speak, and how to write. I, I like that, straight to the point. <laughs> um, and Speed in terms right. of the the experiential part of it of this, um, I believe you have community partner community organization partnerships that you have, right? To right. to to help students place them to to get these experiences. That's right. Uh, is can you tell us like about one of those partnerships that's that's ongoing right now? Sure. So um, one of the programs that that we interact with is called is VSVS, which stands for Vanderbilt Students Volunteering for Science. And so if you look at the literature, the literature is pretty clear that we lose kids in, in kids' interest in science in middle school. And so VSVS is an opportunity to take essentially lunch bag experiments into uh, under-resourced classrooms in Metro Nashville public schools. And so... Uh, the students design the experiments. They make sure that they meet the state standards. They develop them for the hour time period that they have. They build out the kits. They travel to the schools. And we have about 800 students at Vanderbilt who volunteer. It's the largest uh, student organization on campus. Wow. wow. And I think you need a whole community, right? Back to your That's point right. earlier community development, how, how important uh, that is. So David, as we finish up here, what advice do you give? Um, so there's two, two questions there. One advice for other program directors who want to set up something from like, like CSET at their universities. And then two, to those leaders, the deans, and I believe you were a dean once yourself. Well, what is your advice in terms of their thinking in supporting programs like this in a sustainable way, right? So let's start with the program directors like yourself right now. What advice would you give them as they, if they're trying to design something like this? The most important thing is you have to balance uh, the desire to have course offerings, the flexibility of your curriculum with actually owning your curriculum. So if you have a curriculum that's menu-based, so you're not teaching it, 
then then that makes running the program very challenging and it makes the students training pretty diffuse and mm -hmm. so having having it doesn't necessarily have to be a core like ours but having a critical mass of faculty to offer a, a palette of recurring courses that students can take and get to know CSET faculty, your faculty is critical. So that, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I would say to, to directors. Um, and then how about the deans? To deans, I would say programs like CSET offer a public facing uh, opportunity for a combination of science and the humanities which we typically don't get in uh, higher education, right? And so uh, by supporting an organization like, like uh, the program in Communicating Science and Technology, you're actually doubling down on the investments you've made in the humanities and the sciences because you have a group of dedicated faculty and students who are actively engaged in promoting the discoveries, the science, the connection to society that you're making. And so that, that's an easy investment. It's, it's free advertising. It's free uh, publicity. It's free engagement with the community. And so we're cheap. <laughs> well, you, you heard it. And, and something we didn't talk about, for example, is that you're sitting on mountains of data, right? That's From right. all the students that are taking the courses, what they're telling you, um, and, and then the faculty, what they're learning from doing this, because their cur curriculums are not static. As I know, they're probably That's changing, right. adapting accordingly. And we did not talk about any of that. Hence, David, we need you back next time. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Why do stakeholders choose the Civic Side TV network? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, great question. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a great question. Civic Side TV. Top experts, great questions, new insights. Subscribe to the Civic Side TV network on YouTube and don't miss new insights from diverse stakeholders.